Hi, my name is Dr. Alex Sopko. I would like to speak uh, about a very fascinating uh, problem in biology and my specific uh, point of view on that problem, how I'm interested to approach that problem in biology. And I think it's very exciting uh, experimental model that is uh, certainly a classical model in developmental biology, in regenerative biology. I'm talking about axolotl, Ambistoma mexicanum. Uh, well, those who heard axolotl might think about uh, pets, uh, that uh, some amateur um, biologists or those who love those uh, pets might keep them at home as very exotic animal in aquarium. But uh, literature lovers would uh, think of Julia Cartaser tale called Axolotl, that is classical tale on this on the inspired by that very animal. Uh, well, biologists would think of their uh, classes in developmental biology and uh, their classes in the regeneration biology. I was lucky to hear very excellent lectures by expert in regenerative biology who uh, study that organism. And I mean, first of all, uh, such experts, international experts in regenerative biology as Eli Tanaka, Professor Eli Tanaka, who worked in Europe, in Germany, and then in Austria. And I, I'm talking about Nadia Rosenthal, Professor Nadia Rosenthal, who is also a famous uh, expert in uh, regenerative biology. So their lect classical lectures on the subject are just excellent, excellent introduction into regenerative bio field of regenerative biology. So what is so special about Ambistoma mexicanum? Uh, by the name you figure out that it uh, was discovered on the territory of Mexico. And uh, this is their, uh, those uh, uh, axolotl sleeve. It is actually excellent vertebrate amphibian model organism for biologists. Why? Because for the many decades it has been studied as the model of regeneration. And the key advantage of this model is its ability to regenerate appendages and uh, the whole organs following amputation. Uh, so certain experiments with amputation and grafts uh, of uh, tissues and cells, etc., etc., very elegant experiments have been done over decades and can be found in classical textbooks. What is most exciting now, our days, is that the genome of axolotl have been sequenced uh, several years ago, not uh, this year, not last year, but quite a few years ago. And this is excellent, excellent resource for biologists to approach through genomics approaches, molecularly, uh, what, what is going on, on in the regeneration of that organism. So, it is surprisingly very large genome that was sequenced, a huge, huge genome. Uh, genome contains protein coding and non-coding sequences. And especially we, we can uh, notice uh, many, many regulatory sequences, long non-coding RNAs, micro RNAs, genes that encode RNAs. And uh, those genes have been implicated in axolotl regeneration already. So there are quite a, a large body of evidence that microRNAs and other regulatory RNAs participate and function in the regenerating process. Uh, of course, it is possible, uh, and it, it has been studied, using 
microarray approach with um, microRNA arrays and so on uh, to show how those microRNA expression of microRNAs is regulated over regeneration. And it could be done like a time course experiment over regeneration process. And that, that is classical for microarray analysis. Uh, so uh, I was attracted to a few recent studies using that model organism. And I briefly mentioned those studies that inspire me very, very much. Very, very much. Uh, one uh, area that I think is very promising is the function of senescent cell in development and in regeneration using that very model. And it uh, has been studied already by the group in United Kingdom, in University College London. Uh, and I mean uh, Jeremy Brooks, uh, uh, Maximina Yoon, uh, first author in uh, the study of uh, University College London group published in eLife journal. And the article is called Recurrent Turnover of Senescent Cell During Regeneration of a Complex Structure, published in eLife. Uh, so what is so special about senescent cells? Senescent cells are cells that fall out of the cell cycle and stop to proliferate. They don't die, but they uh, change their phenotype drastically and they start to secrete certain uh, biological active molecules. And that is what specialists in senescence called senescent associated secretory phenotype. Uh, so uh, it is quite interesting that in many models it was shown that senescent cell play important role in development. They show up with all their markers, characteristic of senescent cells in development, in certain stages of development. They may then later disappear. So they're dynamically regulated. And indeed, that study that I just mentioned, it uh, uh, demonstrated that senescent cells in regenerative model of axolotl uh, are being regulated over regeneration. So they show these cells show up in the regenerative tissue. Uh, and uh, they, their number is being regulated. And uh, their um, clearance is achieved very likely by immune cells such as macrophages. So that is basically what this uh, work was uh, focusing on. And I think it's a very interesting model that is worth to pursue in uh, more studies, not only by these groups, but possibly there are other uh, researchers who are interested in that very model. And indeed, that is exactly the case, because another group, group in Australia, led by James Godwin, who works in Australian Regenerative Medicine Institute, and his colleagues uh, working in Jackson Laboratory and also in Europe. And I'm talking, uh, he published uh, the article about uh, the model of cell signaling, molecule uh, uh, kinase signaling in uh, uh, a regenerative tissue of salamander. That work he published in collaboration with Nadia Rosenthal, uh, who works in a Jackson Laboratory now, uh, and uh, Sergei Navashilov, uh, who is an expert in uh, axolotl research working in Europe in the uh, Institute of Molecular Pathology in, in Austria. Uh, 
and I, their colleagues, they published article on signaling from toll-like receptors on the cell surface of the cells to the MAP kinase signaling pathway in uh, salamander cells using cellular models. So in salamander, they used uh, uh, fluorescent cell sorting to analyze those things in individual cells. And I think they published very, very exciting landmark study that was uh, very interesting for myself. They published it in developmental dynamics in last year, 2021. And because this work focused on map kind of signaling, and because it used salamander as a model, uh, I found it very, very attractive model for, for myself. Uh, and uh, this is basically what interests me very much. So I share that interest in uh, signaling in regenerative uh, salamander uh, with that group of researchers. Now, uh, I already mentioned uh, to you uh, Eli Tanaka, Professor Eli Tanaka, and uh, she is world famous world expert in Axolot. So she's very, very, very influential researcher who published important landmark papers in axolotl research. So it happened uh, that I uh, heard her talk, a uh, couple of her talks recently, and those talks on where she spoke about regeneration in axolotl in molecular terms, using molecular markers and fluorescent markers. Uh, well, it happened that it drew my attention that the very subject is very relevant for completely different area of research. I'm talking about research in chemical biology, the field that is now called targeted protein degradation. And so what is the connection between, what could be a connection between targeted protein degradation field and regenerative biology? Uh, well, uh, certain aspect that interests me is the effect of thalidomide and thalidomide derivatives. Why? Because those uh, compounds classically known for their uh, effects that happen to be teratogenic effects, uh, they, teratogenic effects of thalidomide might involve some uh, developmental defects in limb development, in limb development. So because of that impact of those compounds on limb, limb development, uh, uh, that raises the question of molecular mechanism, how, what actually happens in molecular terms that causes this kind of uh, very drastic de uh, developmental uh, effect. And now, these days, they know that thalidomide and thalidomide derivatives, they function, and this is being actively used now, in our days, by bioengineers and by chemical biologists, that very molecular mechanism of action of those compounds. Because they work through recruiting ubiquitin legs. And ubiquitin ligase that they natively recruit, natively recruited ubiquitin ligase, it works through certain, it uh, targets a certain transcription factor. I don't go now into details of molecular mechanism of action of thalidomide and thalidomide derivatives, but it is being used now actively to study and to being employed in bioengineered compounds 
used for targeted protein degradation. So uh, because I tied those things together, I dared to write a letter to Professor Tanaka and also to ask her over her lecture the question about possible connection between limb regeneration and those very effects of thalidomide and thalidomide derivatives. So what is basically the question? The question is, uh, is it possible to dissect lib development defects using axolotl model? That was interesting me because, of course, uh, uh, compounds are teratogenic, but they are being used uh, very actively in uh, now, until now, in clinics, and uh, they are being now pursued as a platform for their derivatives are being pursued as a platform for uh, new generation of uh, protein degradation molecular glues and uh, protein chimeras. It is very curious if uh, those very compounds can be studied using axolotl model because if they happen to affect limb development in vertebrates, can we trace that very effect using axolot models in which that development can be uh, played using regeneration, uh, using regeneration process, using amputation regeneration process. So uh, it is interesting to study development, limb development, using axolotl and, U and limb regeneration and how those very uh, compounds that possibly involved endogenous ubiquity in ligers might affect this effect. So you see that possibly that points us how critical certain E3 ubiquity in ligases and that endogenously function over limb development, how critical their function could be. And those are unknown things. So I asked Professor Eli Tanaka about those things, and uh, she mentioned to me briefly that possibly it's something really worth to study, but we didn't uh, agree immediately with her to follow up that certain specific project, even though I think that is might be a very worthy project to pursue. So, and that's why I am talking about those things now, trying to present it to you now. Well, uh, let me uh, let me here mention a few other things that also interest me in that model. Uh, certainly, I'm interested myself due to my research background, I am quite interested in signaling pathways that are relevant and functioning over development. And uh, my focus would be just my favorite pathway. It is protein kinase signaling through MAP kinase model. And uh, you already see that I mentioned to you study by Goodwin, uh, Nadia Rosenthal and colleagues about MAP kinase signaling and their activation by toll-like receptor in salamander. So you see, uh, it is indeed biologically relevant pathway. So we already have uh, studies, preliminary studies that point to importance of that model in uh, salamander development. Uh, I also mentioned to you ubiquitination pathway and E3 ubiquitin ligases and uh, I gave you a certain hint that given what we know about uh, effect of uh, thalidomide on uh, limb development that could be that uh, 
Indeed, endogenous ubiquitin ligases are actively involved, play a critical role in limb development. And that's what we can guess from previous studies. Of course, uh, we need to mention those, bi those methodologies that are relevant to study those questions. And it could be either cell-based models that we can use cell lines, so we can isolate primary cultures or uh, certain cell lines to study uh, molecularly uh, those things using cellular model, cell culture model. Or it could be uh, more in vivo type of studies using, using the sample obtained from developing or regenerating limb. Uh, what type of molecular studies are relevant? What kind of perturbation can be done in terms of biological experiment? Of course, now these days, it is possible to uh, screen for function of genes using uh, screens that uh, knock down the expression of the gene either on the protein level or more often on, on mRNA level. This could be either RNAi screen or now our days more f fashionable and the uh, favorite tool by biologists are CRISPR screens that are inhibit screens that inhibit gene expression for genes that inhibit screen expression using CRISPR libraries. And those uh, CRISPR uh, tools already have been applied in axolotl. So it is possible to use CRISPR in axolotl as it is possible to use in any other species. That's, I think, uh, very attractive. And also, in terms of uh, uh, RNA perturbation, uh, it is quite possible to use using either cellular or uh, other models, uh, morpholina antisense RNA oligos, individually targeting specific genes or microRNAs or specific genes. Those could be micro-injected into regenerative tissue. If we study uh, regeneration in vivo, they can be uh, Microinjected into oocytes of axolotl to trace how it affects subsequent developmental stages in this organism. So oocytes are being used for microinjection of antisense RNA oligos, and then uh, if uh, it impacts this uh, manipulation, impacts development, we can trace phenotype in developing axolotl. Um, so, you see, cell-based phenotypic assays can be used. Uh, and also, it could be either the panel or a certain library that uh, can encompass a group of genes or the whole genome, like this real large-scale screen, which is much, much, much more laborious and difficult to interpret. And you need uh, to have excellent established working assay, validated assay, uh, with uh, clear uh, biological output of that assay that is quantitative and measurable. Um, otherwise, uh, such per genetic perturbations may uh, identify genetic suppressors of the phenotype. And uh, search for genetic suppression is the same as in classical second site suppressor uh, 
studies that would, were done in other organisms. So basically the idea is that second site suppressor might affect phenotype of the mutant, reverse the phenotype of the mutant, and then it places uh, genes in the same pathway. Uh, well, obviously, the ultimate goal of such studies would be to implicate uh, homologous genes, genes that have homologs, in higher vertebrate organisms, including humans, in the regeneration process. And the target search and validation for the genes, genes that play critical role in development. So, uh, uh, most promising are or genes that have orthologs in humans and mice and uh, 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 other higher organisms. Thus, could become draggable targets for pharmaceuticals, and uh, they are relevant for human regeneration. That's ultimate goal of such studies. So, uh, you see, my own interest is mostly focused on map kinase signaling and E3 ubiquitin like and ubiquitin like modifications, like sumoylation, but we don't need to limit ourselves on. Uh, some specific uh, model when we deal with those fundamental questions because uh, we don't know what we can discover over such studies. Thank you for your attention.